This is the story of a defeated nation, plunged into turmoil and chaos. A nation, starving, embarrassed, shattered, and crying out for a savior. It is the story of that willing savior, an Austrian corporal, who emerges from the chaos, using it to rise to the very top. A savior who will then use the tools of democracy to destroy democracy itself and usher in his vision for the nation, a Third Reich. It is the story of a regime that will unleash a new type of warfare on the 20th century, mechanized warfare, which will leave the world aghast with its swift and brutal conquests. It is the story of a greater German empire whose territories will stretch from the western borders of France far into Eastern Europe. It is the story of a brutal regime whose policies of living space and extermination will unleash a wave of premeditated murder beyond human comprehension. It is the story of a darkness, a darkness over Deutschland. Towards the end of the First World War, a 26-year-old art student is discharged from the German army on account of wounds received on the Western Front. Though he fought for the Kaiser's Imperial Germany, the young man is born outside of the German Reich. He is an ambitious artist who has developed a passion for Germanic ideology, reading any literature he can find on the history and the mythology of the Teutonic people. After arriving in Munich in late 1917, he co-founds a working group to create a Third German Reich. The group adopts an array of occult ideas, including esoteric ideological racism and esoteric symbols, such as the swastika. Within a matter of weeks, two members of the Young Artists Discussion Circle found the German Workers' Party, the DAP, which is soon renamed the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the very Nazi party that would achieve ultimate power in Germany just 14 years later. The young artist in question is not Adolf Hitler, but Walter Nauhaus, leader of the Germanic Order of the Holy Grail and co-founder, along with Rudolf von Sebottendorf, of the Proto-Nazi Thule Society. Darkness over Deutschland, Episode 1, The Thule Society and Impending Apocalypse Though Walter Nauhaus and the Thule Society predate Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party, Nauhaus is hardly the first Germanic figure with esoteric, anti-Semitic, and neo-paganist beliefs to form a pro-Germanic Aryan order. In the late 19th century, the German-speaking world experiences a revival in occultism, esotericism, romanticism, and mysticism. Infused with anti-Semitism and a thirst for ancient Aryan knowledge, new, esoteric, ideological systems are developed in Austria. Arminism, created by Guido von Liszt, is a racial religion premised on the concept of renouncing the imposed Semitic creed of Christianity and returning to the native religions of the Ario Germanics. Von Liszt calls his doctrine Arminism after the Arminen, a supposed body of priest kings in the ancient Ario Germanic nation. Another Austrian esoteric ideological system is developed by Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels. He calls this new ideology regarding the Aryan race, runic symbols, and occultism. Ariosophy, meaning wisdom concerning the Aryans. When a young Adolf Hitler, intent on avoiding service in the multinational Austro-Hungarian army, leaves Vienna in 1913, the folkish, esoteric center of gravity migrates with him. In the final months before the outbreak of war in Western Europe, major figures in the Austrian Arminist and Ariosophic scene, such as Guido von Liszt, Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels, and Karl Maria Villegut, leave for Germany where their ideas will find their greatest intellectual and political expression. Beginning in the final years of the Wilhelmina Empire and continuing into the first post-war years, hundreds of Bavarians, Saxons, and Silesians create a vast array of Ariosophic splinter groups. Prominent among this array of splinter groups is the Saxon-based German Order, founded by Theodor Fritsch. Fritsch is one of Germany's most vehement anti-Semites, believing that German society should be purged of all Jews, and even publishing Germany's oldest anti-Semitic paper, the Anti-Semitic Correspondence. In 1890, he is elected a Reichstag representative for the radically folkish and anti-Semitic German Social Party. Here, 
He plays an important role in the socially reformist right. He joins both the Guido von Liszt Society and Lanz von Liebenfels Order of the New Templar. Fritsch's German Order is the ultimate Ariosophic society, rife with occult rituals and strange border scientific theories about root races. When founding the German Order, Fritsch simultaneously creates a political working group in order to circulate his folkish, esoteric program to a wider public. He names this political working group the Reich Hammer Association, named after his famous anti-Semitic publishing company Der Hammer. Its goal is to commence an Aryan-Germanic religious festival founded on Germanic supremacy over lower working races and an inexorable hate for the Jews. Like so many other Aryan-focused anti-Semitic groups that emerged in the last two decades of the German Empire, Fritsch's German Order and Hammer Association see few real-world results and garner little influence before the First World War. But the obscure German Order will become something of a halfway point between late Wilhelmina-era Ariosophy and the early Nazi Party. Under the leadership of Walter Nauhaus and Rudolf von Sabotendorf, a renegade Munich-based chapter of the German Order will find new life under a different name, the Thule Society. Theodor Fritsch's attempt to combine folkish esotericism and politics via the German Order and the Hammer Association sets the order apart from other Ariosophist groups and political parties, such as the Order of the New Templars and the German Social Party that precede them. The German Order requires its members to meet strict racial criteria, including an Aryan clause that forbids Jewish ancestry of any kind. It even publishes its own Ariosophic journal, complete with a swastika on its front cover. The goal of the Reich Hammer Association is to transcend the petty bourgeois nature of the late Wilhelmina anti-Semitic movement and to bring together all racially motivated reformist groups with national and social values. It seeks to link folkish businessmen with national workers, army officers with professors and shopkeepers with peasants. In short, it worked to transcend Germany's deeply ingrained class system and religious divide. Theodor Fritsch urges collaboration with Catholics and the spreading of propaganda to workers, farmers, teachers, and officers. Individual chapters of the German order even establish their own youth movement. Fritsch and co-founder Hermann Pohl build up a broad coalition of like-minded politicians and intellectuals. This list includes prominent figures in the scene such as Guido von Liszt, Rudolf von Sebottendorf, Lanz von Liebenfels, and Bernhard Kerner, a man who signs off his letters with ancient runic symbols and will later go on to play a major role in the SS. The group meets near the Quedlinburg Castle at the foot of the Brocken in the Hartz Mountains, the very site of Walpurgisnacht in Goethe's Faust, and later of Nazi archaeological projects. These prominent folkish esotericists were sometimes joined by a number of fellow travelers such as Field Marshal Erich von Ludendorff, German conservative leader Alfred Hugenberg, and Heinrich Klass, head of the Pan-German League. The program of the Hammer Association is rife with racialist hysteria, premised on an apocalyptic war between ario germanic peoples and lesser races such as the Jews. Fritsch pushes a pathological brand of anti-Semitism, combined with a belief in the superiority of the Germanic race. Twenty years before the coming of the Third Reich, the German order advocates for the deportation of what they term parasitic and revolutionary mob races. Anticipating Hitler's infamous speech from January 1939, co-founder Hermann Pohl announces, If the Jews prepare to exploit war or revolution, then their annihilation will occur through the sacred Weime, which will smite the mass criminals with their own weapons. Pohl's speech of mystical racism provides an apocalyptic justification for political violence and advocates the murder of Jews. It invokes the secret semi-mythical Vemic courts of medieval Westphalia that murdered criminals and helped justify political murder in the Weimar Republic. However, with war yet to arrive in Europe and with Germany experiencing relative economic and political stability, the Reich Hammer Association has trouble in attracting supporters. Its highly restrictive racial requirements, elitist structure, and prohibitive dues also limit its membership. 
It also suffers from the same internal squabbling that had rendered all previous folkish esoteric parties ineffectual for the previous thirty years. When war does eventually break out in 1914, both the Reichhammer Association and the German Order fall into disarray, with half of its members being called up for military duty. Of the war, Hermann Pohl writes to a colleague, The war has come to us too early. The German order was not yet completely organized and crystallized. If the war lasts too long, the order will go to pieces. But as the war continues to rage in Europe, ordinary people find their convictions and values torn from them. To address their social and spiritual needs, ordinary Germans begin to fall into the arms of illusion, an illusion that promises wish fulfillment and a more hopeful future. Almost overnight, the German order, the Reich Hammer, and other racially motivated and esoteric orders grab the attention of many who have not previously cared for their message. As the war progresses over multiple years, the death toll skyrockets to over one million German deaths, and the racial utopian fantasies pushed by the German nationalist right reach a fever pitch. Theodor Fritsch and Hermann Pohl try to capitalize on this wartime radicalization of the masses by creating a broader, folk-minded, nationalist coalition. In spite of this, the Hammer Association is eventually absorbed into the German Nationalist Protection and Defense Organization, one of the most powerful nationalist organizations in the country. If you are enjoying this YouTube podcast episode of Darkness Over Deutschland, please support this channel by taking a few seconds of your time to like this video or leave a comment. This helps to ensure Enigma Productions can continue to make new videos and podcasts on this platform. In 1917, Rudolf von Sebottendorf attends one of Pohl's meetings and immediately impresses Pohl with his folkish, esoteric convictions and is soon entrusted to renew the Bavarian chapter. Sebottendorf, who had previously joined Fritsch's German order, is a former engineering student obsessed with Oriental mysticism. Having dropped out of his engineering studies, he moved to Egypt and later to Turkey, where he immersed himself in theosophy, Sufi Islam, and astrology. After a few years abroad, he returned to Germany where linked up with a group of Berlin occultists around a newspaper called The Magic Pages, where he worked on a manuscript about magical amulets. Sabotendorf envisions the Valfader chapter of Bavaria as a social national organization that combines a pathological brand of anti-Semitism with a belief in the superiority of the Germanic Nordic race. In many ways, however, his chapter does not differ much from the German order that preceded it. Like the German order, the chapter is organized along Masonic lines, with the society itself still very much a secret. It produces few written documents, and on the few occasions when political correspondence does occur, it is communicated through ancient Germanic runes. The chapter even sponsors an occult journal called Runes, and continues to give lectures on pendulum dowsing and astrology. For all his experience and ideas, Sebottendorf's Valfater chapter does not progress any further than the previous German order, which Pohl had broken away from one year earlier. But the devastating impact of the war soon begins to radicalize even the most level-headed and apolitical members of the chapter. As the summer of 1918 begins with Germany on its last legs, and the prospect of victory looking bleak, Sebottendorf decides he will enter politics. He soon meets a person he considers to be his kindred spirit. During a recruitment drive for new members for the Valfater chapter, he meets a sculptor by training, a man who is fascinated by the esoteric side of the Kabbalah as well as Egyptian and Hindu religious beliefs. His name is Walter Nauhaus. By the time Walter Nauhaus meets Rudolf von Sabotendorf, he has already established a discussion group with his friend Walter Dyke. Their group discussions focus on Oriental mysticism and esoteric ideas. They call their small discussion group the Thula Society, named after the lost civilization of Hyperborea, or Thula, a supposed ancient Aryan civilization. Before meeting Sabotendorf, this Thula Society discussion group remained entirely apolitical and has no connection to the German order. This begins to slowly change when Nauhaus is appointed as the Valfater chapter's deputy recruiter. In the summer of 1918, Sabotendorf and Nauhaus host frequent meetings of the German order at the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich. 
to cover their activities, Nauhaus suggests the idea of changing the name of the Valfater chapter to the more innocuous-sounding Thula Society. On August 17, 1918, as Erich von Ludendorff's final offensive fizzles out on the Western Front, Sabatendorf merges the Bavarian Valfater chapter of the Germanic Order with Nauhaus's Thula Society. The new name allows the politically revolutionary Thula to meet openly at the Four Seasons Hotel and draw an eclectic crowd of pan-Germans, including females, despite the government closely monitoring extremist political organizations. Newly initiated male members of the Thula Society are encouraged to wear a bronze pin featuring a swastika and two spears. Newly recruited female members are given a golden swastika badge. The inclusion of female members marks a departure from previous Germanic orders such as Liebenfeld's New Templars and Fritsch's German Order. The Thule Society also attempts to branch off into northern Germany by gaining support from remnants of the German Order in Berlin, something that had proved difficult for Fritsch and his predecessors in the past. In addition to these changes, the Thule Society's focus on occult and esoteric subjects is also balanced more than its predecessors with a larger focus on politics. The society wants a greater Germany devoid of Jews, Freemasons, and Communists, and proposes social reforms to help unite the forces of labor and capital. The social national elements of the order are more pronounced than they ever were in the German order. Sabatendorf has a hostility towards capitalism and a sympathy for workers that in his own words is not Marxist or socialist, but quintessentially German. He wants to eliminate Jewish capitalism, so that honest German workers and small businessmen can thrive. Given the upper middle class and even bourgeois status of the Thule Society's membership, this economically progressive program is particularly striking. After the merging of the Valfater chapter into the Thule Society, Sabatendorf purchases a Munich newspaper, the Munich Observer. Masquerading as a sports paper, the Observer flies under the radar of liberal and socialist opposition. As Sabatendorf reasons, a Jew is only concerned in sport if it shows a profit. Within one year of its purchase, the Munich Observer will change its name to the Volkischer Beobachter, later becoming the principal press vehicle for the Nazi party. In October 1918, just a month out from the end of the war, the Munich Observer's head sports writer and new political editor Karl Harrer co-founds the Political Workers' Circle with his fellow Thule colleague Anton Drexler. Only a few weeks later, Drexler suggests changing the group name to the German Workers' Party, the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, a.k.a. the DAP. Though he does not personally spearhead this new working-class initiative, Sibotendorf recognizes that the Thule Society needs more working-class support in order to gain political influence and lends his support to both Harrer and Drexler. As the military catastrophe of November 1918 looms and left-wing revolution begins to take hold, the center-left governing coalition of liberals, Catholics, and social democrats begins to encounter increased opposition from striking workers and mutineering soldiers. Worker demands are soon taken up by new, more radical independent socialists, the USPD, and the Communist Party of Germany, a.k.a. the Spartacist Party, the KPD. These left-wing parties want an immediate end to the war and the abdication of all monarchy. They experience the most success in Munich, the very base of the Thule society. Here, Kurt Eisner and his independent socialists manage to overthrow the Wittelsbach monarchy and declare a socialist republic on November 8, 1918, just one day before the armistice. For those who believe in the racial apocalypse, such as Sabatendorf and his Thule brethren, experiencing Eisner's Socialist Republic, followed by the armistice and the downfall of the German Empire, is nothing short of catastrophic. Only prominent in folkish, esoteric circles before the war, apocalypticism soon becomes a staple of mainstream German culture. Faced with defeat and a left-wing revolution, Germans such as Sabatendorf and his colleagues are confirmed in their view that the end of days is upon them. As a German soldier states in the early weeks of the Weimar Republic, 
Jews and profiteers became rich, feasting and living at the cost of the folk, as if in a promised land. Germany appears lost. Resigned, the front soldier attempted to safeguard his family from ruin and hunger, strikes and revolts. Germany's fate appears sealed, the world upside down. The front soldier and a decent part of the population led a nearly hopeless struggle against this epidemic. Parliamentarianism was celebrated like an orgy. Roughly thirty-five parties and factions arose and confused the folk, a pure witch's Sabbath. The German folk, devoid of political acumen, staggered toward the diverse will-o'-the-wisps, sick in body and soul. Much like the sense of apocalypticism, prior to the war, the idea of a racial struggle against liberals, socialists, and Jews made very little headway in Munich outside of Germanic esoteric circles. But after the left-wing revolution and the takeover by the Munich Soviets, violent anti-Semitism skyrockets in popularity, paving the way for Munich to become the logical center for National Socialism. On the 8th of November, 1918, just one day after Kurt Eisner declares his Socialist Republic in Bavaria, Sabatendorf calls a meeting of the Thule Society. With tensions high and a feeling that the apocalypse has arrived, he addresses his congregation. Yesterday, we experienced the collapse of everything which was familiar, dear, and valuable to us. In the place of our princes of Germanic blood rules our enemy, Judah. What will come of this chaos we do not know yet, but we can guess. A time will come of struggle, the most bitter need, a time of danger. As long as I hold the iron hammer, I am determined to pledge the Thula to this struggle. The Thula's political purpose and its future path are now clear. They can no longer sit idly by in the Four Seasons Hotel discussing Germanic runes and divining rods. In order to restore a racially pure German empire and reverse the consequences of the country's defeat, they will need to take up arms against their enemies. Barely two weeks out from Sabatendorf's declaration of war, the Thule will find themselves joined in this mission by a young Austrian corporal, freshly returned from the war to his newly adopted home of Munich. An Austrian corporal by the name of Adolf Hitler 